Following the last few episodes on Milford Christian, I've received a number of questions on the Sticky Beak Facebook page. One listener named Charlie wrote, Maybe I missed something, but what did the last episodes have to do with Mark or Doreen or anything tied to this podcast? Another listener named Skip, who's been with me since the faded out days, echoed this concern. I have been asking the same question myself. Not being religious, I listened with an open mind, but still came across baffled as to the relevance to finding Doreen or finding justice for Doreen. I almost found that last episode irrelevant, except I know Jessica always has a master plan. Allison, a third listener, took another tack. Were the majority of parents okay with Susan's tactics, she asked? Was it part of the culture, or did they not know? Because I promise you, I would catch a case if one of my kids experienced Mrs. Martin. Master plan is right. The answers to these questions are multidimensional and interrelated, and they're going to take me a while to unpack. I've said before that Milford Christian represents a microcosm of the tightly circumscribed environment Doreen existed in when she was with her father. But remember it's also, quite literally, the world where Mark worked and prayed and lived during the almost 25 years that had been a void for me in his history. In a phrase, you're going to want to stay with me. Let's start at the beginning, Milford Christian Academy's Parent Student Handbook. First authored by original headmaster Ronald Kirk, the handbook opens with Bible verses on the teaching of children. Give ear, O my people, to my law, read Psalms chapter 8, verses 1 through 7. Incline your ears to the words of my mouth. I will open my mouth in a parable. I will utter dark sayings of old, which we have heard and known and our fathers have told us. We will not hide them from our children, telling the generation to come the praises of the Lord and his strength and the wonderful works that he has done. For he established a testimony in Jacob and appointed a law in Israel, which he commanded our fathers that they should make known to their children, that the generation might come to know them the children who would be born, that they may arise and declare them to their children, that they may set their hope in God and not forget the works of God, but keep his commandments. Next is Deuteronomy chapter 6, verses 5 through 7. You shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, and with all your might. And these words which I command you today shall be in your heart. You shall teach them diligently to your children, and shall talk of them when you sit in your house, when you walk by the way, when you lie down, and when you rise up. Go therefore and make disciples of all the nations, Matthew beseeches, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit, teaching them to observe all things that I have commanded you to, and lo, I am with you always, even to the end of the age. Finally, there is Isaiah. Those from among you, he instructs, shall build up the old waste places. You shall raise up the foundations of many generations, and you shall be called the repairer of the breach, the restorer of the street to dwell in. The handbook tells us that the Academy's spiritual and practical goal is a simple and worthy one, to raise good Christian kids who, quote, follow Jesus in all matters, in every area of life, taking every thought captive to the obedience of Christ. We believe, the handbook reads, that the Lord has called Milford Christian Academy to minister to families who are convicted that their children ought to be brought up in the Lord for all of his purposes, to be filled with godly character, knowledge, wisdom, skill, and anointing, to live in today's world, but on God's terms, and for all his glory, beginning with the word of God. Before Milford Christian can instill a child with true Christian character, we are told, that child must master self-government, the internal strength of spirit to rule over his flesh, to stand strongly against the temptations to sin. This manifests itself in faith and steadfastness, brotherly love and Christian care, diligence and industry. These are perfected in the devout child of God who is practiced unto habit of the heart, the ways of God in every thought and action. To be self-governed, of course, kids had to follow the rules, but so, also, did their parents. The parent-student handbook, it tells us, quote, represents the formal covenant between Milford Christian's administration and parents, in spirit and in deed to work together for the education of the children, the school, and the home, each contributing its appropriate part and each agreeing to uphold the policies herein. Under Ronald Kirk, the children also had to sign class constitutions, of which there was a grade school version and a high school version. For the little kids, 
Growing and learning in Jesus meant developing self-government and obedience with cheerfulness. If we all do this, grade schoolers were told, then the teacher can conduct the class in a way which will make us able to learn and grow. A class governmental constitution helps the children to know their part for a happy class. Older kids were to be examples for the younger children, as Jesus was to be to them. The philosophy of this class, their constitution read, was that Jesus Christ has a preeminent right to reign in every aspect of our lives. Our goals are to prepare the student in the character and ability needed for the highest expression of Christian living, leadership, and liberty. The purpose of this constitution, then, is to assist the student himself to become the more successful and to help him contribute to the success of the class and the school as a whole. In the beginning, under Ronald Kirk, the rules were what you would expect from a strict evangelical Christian school. Firm, yes, but mostly benign. Kirk's constitutions focused on the children's general manners and conduct, asking the kids not to loiter, to take care of their notebooks, to raise their hand if they wish to speak. Love your neighbor by being a good example, the constitutions read. Do all things carefully. Think before you do. Again, Kirk's goal was a simple one. True discipline, he wrote, is first a matter of the attitudes of the heart, with corresponding outward actions following. The classroom is generally a cheerful place because the children learn to be self-governed and do not need a taskmaster, facilitator, or elaborate reward-punishment system to externally manipulate behaviors in the practice of atheistic theology. Rather, a loving parent-like relationship prevails, which is true biblical education. This all changed in 1999, when Pastor Jim Loomer forced Kirk out as headmaster and put Susan Martin in charge of drafting the school's handbook. Swelling the document from Kirk's original 17 pages to 46, Susan's edits and additions, couched as they were in Bible passages, might strike religious leaders as virtuous, high-minded. But Susan was brooking no nonsense about happy classrooms, about teachers leading their students with love. She cast Milford Christian in the role of the eagle, now the school's mascot, screeching in for a landing over an image of the American flag on the handbook's opening page. The eagle, she noted, represented the power of God's protection over his people, just like the power that God had granted Milford Christian over the children entrusted to their care. Behold, the handbook quotes Jeremiah, he shall come up and fly like the eagle and spread his wings over Basra. The heart of the mighty men of Edom in that day shall be like the heart of a woman in birth pangs. Deuteronomy reads, as an eagle stirs up its nest, hovers over its young, spreading out its wings, taking them up, carrying them on its wings, so the Lord alone led him, and there was no foreign god with him. To Jim Loomer, Susan Martin, and their acolytes, this wasn't just flowery language, and the covenant they signed with Milford Christian's children and parents wasn't just a set of rules. It was a set of warnings to be heeded. The handbook quotes Ezekiel, in which God says to his children, when I passed by you again and looked upon you, indeed your time was the time of love. So I spread my wing over you and covered your nakedness. Yes, I swore an oath to you and entered into a covenant with you, and you became mine. To the children of Milford Christian Academy, that was more of a threat than a promise. I'm Jessica fritz Aguirre, and this is Sticky Beak, Season 3, Episode 7, You Became Mine. Wow. Softly children, walk, softly children, walk, softly children, find your freedom, little children, walk, softly children. A big thank you to our sponsors, JPEX Financial and probate attorney Mia Sradosky. JPEX is a female owned and operated financial services company. Jamie and Carol can help you plan for all phases of life, from homing in on retirement to planning for your children's education. Whatever the milestone may be, they'll be there to serve you. Please visit their website, www.jpexfinancial.com, or call 860-430-5397 to speak with Carol or Jamie and take care of your financial future. And make sure your estate is in order with Nia Sardosky, a probate attorney who did mine and Joe's estate planning, something we've been putting off for years. Nia is excellent at her job, 
and gave us peace of mind for our future. Please call 860-966-9968 or visit ncsestateprobatelaw.com. By now it should be obvious that Milford Christian Academy wasn't a happy place. But it's a testament to the school's power that it could make even the simplest things, the most banal annoyances of childhood, not only difficult, but painful. To fully grasp this, we have to examine how the school puts its rules into practice. Let's start small with a necessary evil. Homework, the handbook reads, is a significant part of the student's grade. Assignments received late will lose a letter grade for each day late. Simple, right? Not at Milford Christian. Even like not doing my homework or not having my homework and getting sent to the office. It's like, did I deserve to get paddled because I didn't do my homework? I don't know. Like, just stupid things. I remember, like, a lot of them. But little things like that, that it was like, why is this, why is this, like, deserving of a paddling? Can I just, like, get in trouble and get an F? I mean, <laughs> why do I have to get slapped on my ass for it? Years later, these former students are finding their answers in the handbook. Students should understand, Mrs. Martin writes, exactly why they are being corrected. For example, a student should know that he is not being corrected for forgetting homework, but for a willfulness, that is the unwillingness to make an effort to correct the habit of negligence with respect to the homework. The smallest things were regulated in ways that might seem silly, but become ominous once you hear how those regulations were applied. Ballpoint pens, for example, were banned. Fat and ink cannot be erased, Susan wrote, so its use tends to produce greater care and attention, and ultimately, excellence in effort and handwriting. In addition, it is a fine and valuable tool that teaches good stewardship. That's a worthy goal, sure. But one Milford Christian mom told me that every time her son made even the smallest mistake, Mrs. Martin ripped up his work and made him start over. Even the ink's color was regulated limited to blue for the younger kids, while the older students also were allowed to use black. Again, this seems like a little thing, until you learn that Susan once beat a girl for using turquoise. The school also insisted on cursive. Penmanship, the handbook reads, represents an opportunity for personal achievement and excellence. The character built through the habit of excellence in writing will be carried to all areas of effort. Interacting with my sources, I had been struck by how gorgeous their writing was. One sent me a diagram of Milford Christian's interrelated families, each name so perfect it looked computer-generated. I handed my notebook to another who asked if she could jot something down. Hope you can read cursive, she joked, and I watched the beautiful letters take shape. Nine years of Catholic school made me a big fan of script, which these days seems a dying art. So Susan's efforts, it seemed, had paid off. It was only later that I realized what these children had gone through to be able to write so beautifully, the repercussions they suffered. Students were made to write their letters over and over and over again, until a teacher deemed each and every one flawless, a standard of perfection Mrs. Martin always kept just out of reach. If you did well enough but finished too quickly, you were accused of not taking it seriously, of rushing your work, and sent back to start again. Teachers would hold up good work as an example, but would also make sure to showcase bad penmanship and mock the offending student in front of their classmates. Susan would walk among the rows of desks and smack your hand if you weren't holding your pen right. And once you mastered cursive, there was no going back, because print was banned. One former student has lost the ability to print entirely. And there's more. I didn't realize how much I had repressed or just pushed back and forgot about until I started talking about all of this. And I realized that, you know, I am grown now and I'm out of the situation. But like I was telling my fiance, there are things I am noticing in now in my adult life that have been molded and and shaped by Berean. Like, I remember I was terrified to learn cursive writing. I can't remember what grade it was, if it was third or fourth grade, somewhere around there. Maybe, maybe even fifth. I don't know. I think it was younger than that, though. I think it was around third grade is when we started learning 
cursive writing. And I remember before the school year had started, they told us that we were going to be learning cursive that year. And I remember cursive writing looked so intimidating to me that I cried every time I thought about it. I cried because I was so scared. And, you know, I was already horrible at math. And, you know, you heard the story about the multiplication and the chalkboard and being looked at by everybody. But cursive writing terrified me. I was so scared that I was not going to be good at it and I was going to get in trouble. And my anxiety was through the roof thinking about it. And the school year hadn't even started yet. And I remember Mrs. sat down with me and because she saw me crying one day and she showed me her cursive writing. <laughs> the snap of a finger, I started crying because her cursive writing was so pretty and it's it intimidated the shit out of me. And she's like, it's really not that hard. I know it looks scary, but it's not. And she was right. You know, once we started learning, it really wasn't that hard. But the fact is, is they made it like mandatory. Like if you did not dot your I's and cross your T's just right, if you didn't do the little swoop de doop at the bottom of a G or a Q, you know, you got in trouble. Or if you used any letters that weren't cursive, you got in trouble. And that is one of the things I carried on into my adult life. And the funny thing is, people compliment my, I guess you would call it mouth writing, because technically I don't write with my hands, I write with my mouth. And people will not only be blown away that I'm writing with my mouth, but the fact that my handwriting is so neat, and I get complimented on my mouth writing my cursive all of the time. And I couldn't understand why I would get sick to my stomach every time someone would compliment me. And I think it really stems from Berean. And I just kind of put that together tonight, listening to the podcast and putting things together and having a lot of things be brought up is just a, a bad place. And I thought... I thought, you know, you do get away, you get out of the situation, and you grow, and you go on about your life. But there are things that still get stuck with you. Susan could take something promising the tiniest hint of joy, like sharing food with a friend, or lending them a piece of paper or fountain pen, and drain it of that possibility. Borrowing, she writes in the handbook, can produce an irresponsible dependent mentality and will be discouraged. While the younger kids' classrooms had a little color for visual stimulation, the older kids typically had nothing more by way of decoration than posters of the Constitution and the Pledge of Allegiance. As for Mrs. Martin, she kept her classroom walls completely barren. School supplies were also required to be plain, avoiding offensive pictures, slogans, or characters. For consistency, the handbook reads, we ask that you not send in anything that has motion picture themes, cartoon characters, superheroes, or fantasy pictures. And it was here that for Susan, dreaming of a world where children were as removed, as isolated, as cut off as possible from a normal existence, the rubber met the road. Her handbook exhorted that the children, quote, be not conformed to the world, but be ye transformed by the renewing of your mind, that ye may prove what is that good and acceptable and perfect will of God. Susan and Pastor Jim found inspiration in the book of John to insist that the children be in this world, but not of it. John chapter 17, verses 14 through 16. I have given them your word, and the world has hated them, because they are not of the world, even as I am not of the world. I do not ask you to take them out of the world, but to keep them from the evil one. They are not of the world, even as I am not of the world. John chapter 2, verse 15 implores, do not love the world nor the things in the world. If anyone loves the world, the love of the Father is not in him. And finally, there is John chapter 15, verse 19. If you are of the world, the world would love its own. But because you are not of the world, but I chose you out of the world, because of this, the world hates you. They teach you, one former student wrote me, that you cannot trust your own mind. 
that you are sinful and vulnerable to demonic influence. So if you have a thought against the church, it's demonic. And if you just want to make a decision as simple as, should I hang out with this person? You can't trust yourself. Because you have to ask, is this what the Lord wants or what I want? And my ways are selfish and not God's ways. Will my fellowship with this person edify Christ or satisfy the flesh? The handbook and the class constitutions weren't enough for Susan, so she cooked up her own little contract for the kids to sign without their parents' okay. Susan's covenant governed not only the children's academic lives, but also what they did in their own homes, on nights and weekends, even during the summer. Just as Mark Vincent had restricted Doreen to TV on Wednesday nights only and forbidden entertainment like Three's Company and George Michael, Susan was hellbent on circumscribing the children's lives as much as possible. And she wasn't going to stop with Mel Gibson's ransom. You couldn't talk about anything that wasn't of God. The fact that I watched horror movies and stuff like that, that was like, I could never talk about that at school. And I remember there was one day where it had gotten brought up that our cartoons we watched were evil. Pokemon, like seriously, Pokemon was evil. The Backstreet Boys band was evil. Everything, uh, Digimon, Pokemon... All that crap was evil. It was a devil's game because there's no such thing as monsters, which they're not monsters. They're just little pets. And that's, again, like they would try and control your life with it. When they found out some kind of topic came up to where my classroom was like, oh, yeah, I I go home and watch TV in my room. And she's like, you better not have TVs in your bedroom. And like everyone kind of looked at each other and I was like, I do. And then almost every person in my class said, I do. And just shook their head and they're like, you really do not need to have TVs in your bedroom. That is wrong. You don't need to have that. That's evil. It's going to lead to evil things. Andrew's experience definitely was not typical. One by one, parents took their kids' TVs away. And for most kids, watching a horror movie was a possibility about as realistic as the special effects in Nightmare on Elm Street. I remember you couldn't watch certain shows, you couldn't watch certain, like, movies rated after anything above rated G you weren't allowed to watch. Mm-hmm. So, like, the only show that they would allow us to watch is Dead Details. Oh, yeah. And Ellie can't stand that show. Anyway, I remember getting in trouble for watching Red Rat. Oh, my God. And I actually just saw something last night on Happy Loomer's Facebook page something against Disney. They just controlled, you know, what you couldn't watch, could or couldn't watch, and it was basically nothing. I grew up watching Disney, loved the movies, and then suddenly I wasn't allowed to watch Pocahontas anymore. Mm-hmm. And because you're like, she's singing to the wind and the rocks, and it's not God, so we cannot watch that. Mm-hmm. And I'm like, please, can I just have an imagination from a child? Mm-hmm. Like, I remember thinking that, like, this stuff isn't bad for me to watch it's fun it's not making me a bad person like i never understood why i wasn't allowed to watch disney stuff at that time right or anything or like nickelodeon like kids geared shows susan's contract was extremely specific they didn't want us to watch powerpuff girl because of the villain him but him was this like villain that was like designed to look like satan but was obviously more like a like, almost like a, an early attempt at a trans character. Talks in a really high-pitched voice, wears, like, skirts, and is always fabulous. Yes. And even though that was, like, a villain character, they were, like, they're exposing our children to this and shouldn't watch it. My parents didn't go that far with it. They let me watch Powerpuff Girls, but there were definitely things that they took from them that we couldn't do, like the Pokemon, the Red Glass. There was all kinds of just seemingly innocuous things that would get banned. Man, I can't tell you how many times I've heard that Rugrats thing from you guys. It's like, you poor kids, everybody, everybody I talked to was like, I just wanted to watch fucking Rugrats. Meeting recently with a group of Milford Christian escapees, I asked why Rugrats, a cartoon about the adventures of a bunch of babies, was such a big deal. I had read somewhere that certain Christian churches thought it encouraged disobedience. That might be, the women told me, but for Susan... It was the fact that the show's opening credits featured a baby's butt crack. A good Milford Christian kid was expected to watch things like Animal Planet, especially shows featuring Australian wildlife expert Steve Irwin. Touched by an Angel and Dr. Quinn Medicine Woman were also good choices. 
If you insisted on kid stuff, there was always Veggie Tales, an animated Christian show where talking vegetables teach Bible lessons to kids. When I moved in with Joe and his two kids in 2009, the girls were addicted to that show via tape sent by their Southern Baptist bio grandma. I'd roll my eyes when it was on, and it was constantly on, but I kind of learned to love it. It was cute and clever, with lessons about sharing, kindness, loving your brother as yourself. Joe and I still sing the songs and laugh with the big girls, now 19 and 21. Maybe, I thought, the Milford Christian kids might have reluctantly embraced Veggie Tales too, like Doreen Vincent had loved Christian singer Amy Grant as well as George Michael. But no. Cut off from their beloved Disney, Rugrats, and other Nickelodeon classics like You Can't Do That on Television, Veggie Tales was pandering, boring, lame. Sometimes it didn't even pass snuff. Susan and Pastor Loomer banned the Veggie Tales movie Jonah and the Whale, where the main character is played by a piece of asparagus, on the grounds that it was historically inaccurate. The issue was Khalil, a half caterpillar, half worm, who sells Persian rugs and listens to self help tapes, who also finds himself in the belly of the whale. It was indoctrination materials. Yeah, so what was, what did you say the one that was off limits was? The Jonah one, the first, like, movie that they did in theaters. I see, because my kids sing the stupid Jonah song from VeggieTales all the time. So why is that not accurate? Um, so they said that it supported, like, Eastern religions because they had that, they had, like, one character that, like, spoke in a vaguely, like, Indian Hindu kind of way and was like all about like inner peace and stuff like that they didn't like stuff like that like meditation was considered evil holidays were also restricted listeners will recall the fit susan threw over a classroom decked out with wrapping paper and a tiny christmas tree tv shows underwent further screening for anything untoward there were tv shows that i wasn't allowed to watch because they had halloween episodes in them they had what in them they had a halloween themed episode i see because Halloween was also something we weren't allowed to celebrate. So if it's got a Halloween episode in the show, the whole series is off limits. Yep. So what do you guys do on Halloween? Because when I was young, I knew a couple Jehovah's Witnesses that didn't celebrate, but that was really it. So what our school did was they hosted, they called it the Harvest Party. Every year on Halloween where we could come in costumes that weren't scary and had no mask and like watch Christian movies. And then I remember after that died down, probably when I was around 13 or 14, they started having us do what they called track or treat, where they would have us go door to door and hand out like Christian pamphlets on Halloween. And if people tried to offer us candy, we weren't allowed to take it. Oh my God. And as kids, are you like, screw this? Or are you just like, yeah, this is what we do? We were like, well, I guess this is our only option. The harvest parties were held at Camp Cedarcrest in Orange, Connecticut where Alan Parody's wife Janet had once prayed over mesh bags of birdseed. Every year, one woman texted me, kids were going on the hayride and jumping off to go trick-or-treating in the nearby neighborhoods. Some alums didn't go trick-or-treating till high school, and some still have never been. One year, a student asked an adult about another girl's hippie costume, only to be told it was demonic. The demon in question was Ron Kirk's daughter. She was older than me, and I looked up to her, the woman texted me. I saw her pushing boundaries, and she caught my eye. Her specific boundary pushing was with barely passing the dress code requirements and a little bit of makeup. She did what she was supposed to do, but you could tell she hated it. The Harvest Party has now been rechristened the Barn Dance, and Jim and Kathy Loomer's three sons are big fans. They made a little video. Oh, we got the Barn Dance coming up, got the Barn Dance coming up. Oh, hell, got the Barn Dance coming on up tonight. Gotta get ready. Let's go, people. Get the Barn Dance. It should go without saying that the Milford Christian kids took after the Kurt girl more than they did the Loomer boys, with Susan's desired effect being immediate and obvious. It was all about controlling our entire lives and trying to clone us. I always felt out of place after being there, trying to figure out what was normal. Pop culture, one wrote me. Her old friend backed her up. My friend felt out of place, she texted, because people would ask her what music she listened to, and we just didn't, because we weren't allowed. 
She overheard someone say they like country music, so she started saying that she liked country music, just to fit in, even though she didn't know what that was. Another heard an outsider say she liked the Backstreet Boys, so by default, she did too. I liked them because that was the only band I knew of that was not church music, this woman wrote in one of the Survivor text threads. So my first CD was Backstreet Boys Millennium. Mine was the Beatles because someone else introduced me to them. I was also introduced to Avril Lavigne, one woman responded, causing the first to laugh. Rebels, she wrote. So I had a tiny bit more culture, said the Beatles fan, but I literally made it my personality. I have John Lennon tattooed on my arm. It only made things worse that for Susan, the rules were for thee and not for me, and the kids knew it. There was more than just banning candy only to eat chocolate in front of the entire class. Susan thought TV was evil, one woman wrote me, until she wanted to sit down in front of it for eight hours with a box of Oreos to watch Law and Order and The Sopranos. A rumor circulated that Mrs. Martin's daughter Emily, the one she'd handed a hammer to smash the older kids' CDs, was allowed to watch whatever she wanted. Maybe that inspired one student to lodge her conscientious objection. I had to sign a contract. My parents probably had to sign one too, I'm not sure, but I definitely did. And it had all these rules on how I could be, couldn't behave like outside of school hours, so it, they like, controlled your life literally 24-7. And so then I wrote in whiteout, where I have to sign my name, I wrote in whiteout because you made me. Because we could only use fountain pens in whiteout. School, you couldn't use that. Then I signed my name, and I just said, because you made me. And she held it up to the light and saw the, what I wrote and ripped it up in front of me and then brought me a new one and made me sign it while she was standing there right next to my desk. I felt like I signed my life away to Susan, the woman texted me later. Sign this paper in front of me right now. See, you agree with everything. It was devastating. Field trips, also circumscribed, provided another arena in which Mrs. Martin failed to practice what she preached. If not to Old Sturbridge Village in Massachusetts, the kids were taken to medieval times. For the uninitiated, the Medieval Times website describes an exciting family-friendly experience inspired by an 11th century feast and tournament. Guests are served a four-course banquet as they cheer for one of six knights competing in the joust and other tests of skill. One part of the experience was decidedly not family-friendly, but that wasn't stopping Susan. We weren't allowed to see parts of medieval times, like the dungeon, but Mrs. Martin went through the band portion, and I thought she was being a hypocrite, one woman texted me. Having no idea what the dungeon was, I YouTubed it and found a fan walking the viewer through the multiple torture devices displayed there, including the rack, the pendulum, and the Judas cradle, which you can Wikipedia at your own risk. I imagine Mrs. Martin was a fan of the net catcher, a large ring with a V-trap opening at the end of a pole. It worked well, the description reads, capturing an evader in a crowd. Once ensnared, the victim had no choice but to surrender to his captor. After that, the dungeon went from R to X-rated. The torture bed down here. Not sure exactly how that works. It doesn't look that bad if you put a mattress on it. I'm really not sure. This is what it says, though. That's a coffin? Naked or nearly naked victims were locked into cages and hung up. That sounds like fun. <laughs> Look at the picture. It doesn't. It, it like doesn't. No, the picture really does not look fun at right? all. Right? Not at all. It looks like he's having a really good job. And then over here, the breast ripper. Okay. All right. Well, that sounds oh, not fun. Ripper. The, the, the what? The titty ripper. The titty ripper. Oh, this is even worse. Oh, yeah. Hair. What does that one do? Um, it goes inside of you and it like opens up. The inside of the cavity in question so is usually your ir- irreparably mutilated. It's probably a butthole. I was saying, it pretty much just tears up your asshole. Fun. Sounds like a great Friday night. Apparently, it did sound like a fun Friday night to the headmistress of Milford Christian. Mrs. Martin was giddy going into the dungeon, one woman texted me. Like, child giddy. To understand why Mrs. Martin was able to get away with so much, it's important to note how strictly she circumscribed the role of the Milford Christian parent. Remember, the handbook was their formal covenant with the school, and throughout it, Susan erected barriers between parents and children, salting it with constant reminders not to second-guess the academy's leaders. 
As Mrs. Martin writes in the handbook section on parental participation, we hope that Milford Christian Academy and the families we serve will be a light to the community as a result of having done our respective jobs to be committed and effective parents and teachers. It is essential that parents support us in carrying out the purposes of the school. We urge the teaching and practicing of the rules of the student constitution at home as a way to help build Christian consistency, love, and respect. The school held several meetings a year that parents were required to attend. Missing one meant you incurred a $50 fine. This included the parent orientation class at the beginning of each year. This class is for the purpose, Susan wrote, of educating parents to the biblical principles upon which the school is based so that we may be of one mind in our task of raising God's children. If school rules apply only to school and not at home, we create an artificial world which many young people will reject as irrelevant because the same principles are not practiced at all times. Only if the home works together with the school and agrees to uphold Milford Christian's policies will the school be able to restore Christian nobility and leadership to not only the home and the church, but the nation itself. Such cooperation meant giving Milford Christian, Susan Martin specifically, the right to discipline your child in whatever arena she encountered them. Even in church, like if you were acting up or doing something wrong and Mrs. Martin was there, she'd take you downstairs and spank you, like even though you weren't at school. That's another thing is Berean really, and even to this day, sent me the handbook of their guidelines and their policies and stuff, and it really hasn't changed. It literally says that if you want to be a part of that school, you're giving them the right to pretty much control and guide your home life, too. Like, not just the student, either. Like, they do it to the parents, too. Susan's power depended on dividing kids from their parents, eroding the trust between them, and supplanting moms and dads as the ultimate arbiter of the kids' lives. If the issue involves a teacher, she wrote as to conflict resolution, it is right that the child first go to his or her parent but it is not appropriate for the parent to take sides when listening to the child's story. Side-taking at this point is tantamount to judging the teacher as unfit. Such judgment will undermine the teacher's authority with the child and thus his respect and with it the ability to teach. Rather, the parent should go as witness while the student raises the issue with the teacher. Our teachers are selected for their transparency and teachableness, which enables us to resolve conflicts by implementing this biblically-based approach. Please give due respect to the ones you have chosen as your representatives, and we will endeavor to do the same to you. To insulate herself from any further second-guessing, Susan added the following. Among adults, if there is any cause for offense, any sin, any conflict between us, we must lovingly confront the other involved. For example, if a parent has a problem with a teacher, the parent must first go to the teacher and not the administration. If no resolution is found, the parent may appeal to a member of the administration, but without gossip, that is, without speaking the offense. A meeting is then arranged so that the administrator can witness the dispute and help resolve it. If the issue is still not resolved, the matter may be taken to the facilitator's board or pastor. As you'll soon learn, Mrs. Martin had no worries in this department, given how tight she was with Pastor Jim. Susan also ensured children couldn't turn to their friends' parents for comfort or guidance, cautioning, While enjoying the warm atmosphere of MCA, we must not throw all caution to the wind in training our children's demeanor towards strangers. It is important to remember that families have entrusted their children to the care of MCA staff and not necessarily to the care of other MCA parents. There are some parents who have rightly emphasized to their children the importance of keeping healthy boundaries between them and strangers. As MCA parents, we want to be careful not to disarm those boundaries. With this in mind, please honor the following guidelines while at MCA. Avoid giving directions to children other than your own unless there is an emergency with no MCA staff member in attendance. Encourage children who may ask you for instructions or favors to see their MCA teacher or staff person. While being courteous to students, please refrain from excessive touching, hugging, sharing food, etc so as not to disarm boundaries set by parents for their children. Any suggestions about a child's future should only be made in the presence of his parent. During your visits to the school, please refrain from greetings, joking, or playing, 
which tend to draw students' attention from their teacher. Rather than correcting the behavior of students yourself, please notify their teacher of their need for correction. Parents should not converse with others' children about personal matters of counseling, debatable doctrinal views, opinions about MCA students, staff, or policies, rumors, etc., without the presence of the children's parent or MCA staff person. Over and over, Susan warned the parents, made sure they knew who was boss. Enrollment, she wrote in the handbook, is always contingent upon the parents' commitment to the same biblical Christian view and practice of education in the home as the rightful ground for our success with your child. We make such a requirement because we know that the home is the key to our success on your behalf. School can only support the work of the home, never replace it. Practically speaking, while we are prepared to assist in this arena, and this is in italics, parents must be willing to take whatever steps are necessary to fulfill their covenant with us. And parents obeyed to their children's devastation. They're the reason why my parents ended up telling me that Santa wasn't real. I was still very little and very much believed in Santa and very much loved the magic of Christmas. Now, it's not like I didn't know, you know, the Christian true meaning of Christmas. My parents taught me that too, but they also let me believe in Santa. And Berean pretty much put a guilt trip on all of the parents saying that they were lying to their children letting them believe in Santa and that it was going to send us to hell. And because they were lying, they were going to get sent to hell too. And I remember they took me into the living room and told me, um, you know, we just wanted to tell you that Santa's not real. And I did not believe them and I fought them. But when they said, yeah, we're the ones who get you gifts. We're the ones who do this. Santa's not real. And Berean wanted us to tell you that. I ran into the laundry room and I started bawling my eyes out. Sometimes children thumb their noses a little bit at the rules, and their parents did too. My dad remembered that Jim was trying to get my little brother to speak in tongues, one woman told me. And my dad said, no, not with my kid. As a flex, Jim did it anyway in front of my dad. And my dad had to say, stop, not with my kid. Mostly, though, just like their children, the parents fell in line. And is anyone breaking these rules? Obviously, are people pretty much staying within the, the lane? Mostly within the lane. Um, I remember one or two girls who, like, dyed their hair and they got in trouble for it. But for the most part, it was kind of just like, all right, we don't want to deal with the consequences. Right. And I feel like the parents were sort of working a lot, in, in a lot of cases, maybe not all, but in a lot of cases, it seems like the administrators and the parents were working hand in hand to enforce these types of things. For some students, I mean, for the parents who didn't really know where they were sending, there were parents that didn't realize what kind of place they were sending their kids. So we would have a lot of kids come for a year and then disappear out of our classes because people realized it was a batshit crazy place. But the parents who, like, knew what we were about were sending their kids there for a reason. Oh, yeah, they were super involved in it. Sometimes the parents would even actively look to the school, Susan Martin specifically, to mete out punishment. It's not normal. And I don't know how it's being run today, but like when I was there, because I went there from kindergarten through seventh grade, and it was like just the gym was the principal and Susan was the vice principal at the time. And like it was supposed to be like gym and they did like whatever they call corporal punishment where they could like stink or paddle, they would call it, the students. And I remember because my mom was so close with Susan Martin, she would, like, call and ask her to paddle me for things that happened at home. It was, like, so I get called into the office, and I'm thinking to myself, like, what did I do? And I remember one time I had I had a birthday party. I think it was my seventh grade birthday party. My mom had come down and saw that we were playing spin the bottle, and I had gotten in trouble for it at home. And then the next day I was getting called into the office, and Susan was paddling me for things in the bottle at my house at my birthday party. And it was like, what is going on? Like, why is that even allowed? Until now, until we started talking, most of my sources had never seen the handbook. One woman wrote me, they literally built it into the handbook that teachers aren't to be questioned by parents. It's against their policy. So the students have nowhere to go for help. It hits hard for me actually seeing it written out as an adult. 
I knew what was happening back when I was a kid, but was hoping that it wasn't as bad as I thought it was, but it's worse. Even now, years later, even after some of these children and even entire families have left the church, the power it holds remains. Many of the former children are entirely estranged from their parents, holding them responsible for the abuse they suffered. Here's the woman whose mother was friends with Susan Martin. And to be honest, I think that's why she got along so well with my mom, because they were close, and my mom's like, I don't speak to my mom now. Okay. And they're like, they really, I don't know what it is. You could diagnose it, whatever, but like they don't even realize the way that they are. I truly believe they don't even have any idea. And it's like, hello, nobody talks to you. Everybody has some kind of problem with you. Do you ever stop and think that it's you? <laughs> they really are, and they like, it's almost, I think has used this word before she's like i really believe it's some kind of like cult they all like don't even see what they're doing they're just like they're so stuck in their practice and in their ways that they don't even like it doesn't even register that they're all like fucked up one has chosen to keep her parents entirely in the dark a former milford christian mother at first wary of my motives and potential backlash warned her daughter not to speak with me She's since changed her mind, praised her daughter for being brave. Another Milford Christian mom was adamantly opposed to being involved, bowing out of a meeting with me and a group of fellow escapees at the last minute. I couldn't tell what scared her more, me or the church. When I was leaving Iran, Iran um, I was told by a senior person there that they've never seen it go well with people who leave here. It was almost like a curse. Who was that person? Kathy. Remember. Oh. So I was surprised when she not only showed up, but stayed and spoke to me for more than six hours. After I left Milford Christian, she told me, I went to graduate school because I was never going to let anyone control me ever again. But there are still doubters. What's the point when mother asked her child when pressed to give me a call? No one cares. And besides, Milford Christian will always have the upper hand. Oh, but that's about to change. Walk softly, children. Walk softly, children. Walk softly, children. Find your freedom, little children.